If you wouldn't mind just telling us who you are. Yeah, I'm an architect, uh, Klaus Philipsen, in Baltimore since 1986. So back, going back to a time when, when the Inner Harbor was the shining piece you visited almost first when you came first to Baltimore. And I didn't know much about Baltimore, but started moving into uh, the area and had a job in the city and still have a job here. So um, therefore. I know the beginning of Harbor Place and I'm still interested in the development there. My professional work did not go uh, into the Harbor Place itself, but I was involved in the 90s in developing a master plan for the former Allied Signal site, which is now Harbor Point. And that site was uh, an industrial wasteland and uh, citizens wanted initially the, the entire thing, 26 acres, to be a park. And then I was part of the negotiations because the cost of the remediation and all that required that the folks wanted to recover some of the cost. And so then six acres were the park and 20 uh, two acres or 20 acres or the development area. And um, as you all can see now, that area has now development rights for, I believe, 3.7 million square feet. And that was more than our original planned unit development of 2.7. And I'm mentioning that because um, that development keeps the promenade open, but pretty much uh, maximizes development on that peninsula. And even then, it is less than what now this new legislation for the Harbor Place would actually allow, which includes a maximum of 4 million square feet. So that would be more than the entire uh, former Allied Signal Peninsula, now known as Harbor Point. So that's um, my focus right now is really looking at these three bills that are before the city council have been introduced in city council and are before the planning commission and due to the technical glitch there are now on um, this Thursday at uh, in the afternoon two o'clock right by a schedule that we start if they're never on schedule and there are three bills and these three bills are of course technical in nature but they change the zoning classification of the inner harbor with ha which has its or of harbor place which has its own zoning classification and eliminates the the height limits to uh, from 100 feet to unlimited and allows development to include parking and even requires parking. Also, the city planning department has uh, suggested an amendment to eliminate that requirement of 3000 spaces. And it includes yeah, residential use, mixed use, and, and, and the maximum of 4 million square feet. And uh, the area gets expanded from what the pavilions are today and to start at the aquarium and go all the way over to Rash Field. And so that entire area would allow these unlimited mixed use developments as long as they don't total more than 4 million square feet with unlimited height. So that, that is somewhat astounding because it is uh, more than MCB's proposal currently shows on their renderings and it would include that the Science Center and the Aquarium also could decide they want to do mixed use and high rises. <coughs> and I cannot see that these bills, if they would pass, have any kind of backstops or any kind of protections that uh, would come into being if something would fall off the rails. So, you know, I'm old enough to know that nothing is ever exactly like a nice rendering. 
and nothing is ever the same as the bill of goods that a developer shows in the beginning to convince everybody. And uh, so at this point, I would suggest everybody just put aside all the questions about the design and the questions about uh, whether this blocks views and what it all does in terms of its actual articulation and focus more on these bills because the pictures are one thing, but the bills allow a lot more than what these pictures show. And so I would think, you know, my mind says, okay, what's the worst case scenario? So the worst case scenario is uh, Brian Book doesn't get the money. He sells the rights. He gets a partner that wants to do something totally different. The recession hits. They say, well, we can't really do the nice stuff anymore, but we do something else. And in each of these cases, what recourse would the city have? And that's really what I'm interested in right now, that the Planning Commission and the politicians that back this understand that they need some leverage to maintain the public interest in the long run. And this is not a question right now of whether this development as it is presented in these renderings is good or not good, but it is a question of should these bills pass without any um, backstops, conditions and, and securities that would kick in if something goes differently than currently anticipated. So that's really the main gist. So um, the broader questions are about basically what happens to that huge waterfront area that is currently public space if those bills uh, get approved um, by the city council, by the, you know, by the planning commission, then through the city council and they go to referendum. If the height restriction is lifted and if the zoning is changed to multi-dwelling, uh, there are no protections for that land anymore, essentially. Well, there are still development areas and the development area grows from 3.3 to 4.5 or 3.2 to 4.5 by 1.3 acres, which sounds like, well, that's not much, but that's 40% more than before. And so they are arguing, yeah, well, that is true, but the public open space afterwards is even still bigger because we are adding the um, part of Light Street and the dog leg between Light Street and Carver Street gets eliminated and so then there's more open space. Those things are very nice. I mean, I absolutely for doing those traffic calming measures and giving uh, Light Street particularly a, a big haircut or a road diet by basically taking half the half that of the median that faces the inner harbor should be added to the inner harbor. So I'm all for that. However, um, the Bramble proposal really is very clear, or he has been very clear in his public statements that he's not going to build this or he's not going to pay for that. That's just on his drawings. And it would then um, be uh, an issue that the city would have to do and pay and I'm not seeing that, you know, that this has been on the table as a suggestion ever since the Air St. Gross Master Plan 2.0 for Harbour Place was on the table some, I don't know, six, six seven years ago. And uh, they started looking with trans traffic engineers, transportation engineers, as to what the implications were to close the dog leg. And then they all threw their hands up and they said, oh, it will be terrible. Because yes, it will be very difficult to kind of show a traffic model that that would go smoothly. So it would be more like San Francisco's Embarcadero coming down in an earthquake. And then the city fathers in their wisdom decided at the time, oh, we don't rebuild this expressway. And then if you had a traffic model, it would have shown total catastrophe. And of course it was sort of a catastrophe, but not from a traffic perspective. Once they cleaned it up and built an urban boulevard there and put a, a streetcar on it, the waterfront uh, in San Francisco is accessible. And, uh, 
the traffic found other ways, then it was not a nightmare. It was actually a benefit. So what do you think about the fact that um, the these bills and this proposal just got put out to the public, like the designs got put out in October, and then the bills got put out shortly thereafter, like within 30 days. The same night. Yeah, right. Um, and they, the designs hadn't yet gone through any of the city planning offices. They're like in the mayor's forum that I went to last week, uh, it, a few people asked about the transportation options, the transit options um, for that main corridor that goes, you know, both to 95 and 83 via Light Street and Pratt and asked um, if there had been transportation studies. And the answer was no, there would be some at some point. So what, what's your reflection on all of that? Well, that's exactly the concern that that um, the city transportation department would come to the conclusion that it's not going to be so easy and not do it or not have the money. I mean, there's another $400 million for these improvements to create all the wonderful stuff that's on these renderings and then there's the question of whether, where the red line should be and Brian Ball's group is certainly pushing for the red line being on Pratt Street. As a former red line transportation transit planner for the old red line that was on under Baltimore Street in a tunnel, I really think that that was the better solution to have it in a tunnel and have it on Baltimore, uh, in uh, Lombard Street, where it would actually be uh, next to the tunnel that's under Baltimore Street for the metro, so they have a, a connection there. And putting the, the red line on surface on Pratt Street would make this problem of deleting the dog like even more difficult. If that were to come to pass, you know, it cannot be solved, but it needs to be done. In, in the, one of the bad outcomes, for example, that there is no backstop against is that uh, MCB get all these development rights. And when you look at the footprints, they could build all this without that Light Street gets altered or that Pratt Street gets altered or that the, the red line goes there or any of that. The, McKeldin Plaza could still be an island and they could still build all their high rises and then the public would say, well, wait a minute, what happened with all the good stuff? And it never happened. So it leaves everything wide open, basically. Well, people need to just understand that that's all possible. Mm -hmm. That there isn't a condition created where anybody says, oh, if you get 900 apartments, you get that because you pay for the wonderful open space and amphitheater and so on that you show on McCollum Plaza and in that area. If, if there was some kind of nexus there to say, well, you get these extraordinary development rights on one of our most valuable pieces of land that was all, by the way, actually designated as open space and parkland in perpetuity, but you get this because you give us all these wonderful other things in return. But that's not the thing. He gets that only so that he can pay his own project, which is like the circular logic that I see there. The project is very expensive because it's so big and it needs to be so big so they can pay the expensive project. That's to me not conducive. I am all for putting more apartments into downtown, but not on public parkland. There are enough vacant spaces and, and, and one of them is owned by MCB on Pratt Street, north of Pratt Street, that, you know, and that would greatly benefit if he uh, built that with 900 apartments. They would still benefit if Harbor Place was redeveloped in some kind of much more modest fashion. Thank you very much for your thoughts.